so you were saying before that you've had difficulty sleeping recently and you've kind of been getting up at 3 or 4 a.m. and there's been like a lot of worries and stress. Is this all related to the bookstore opening or are there other things going on? I mean, there's there's other things going on. My my grandmother turns 99 this year, still lives by herself way back in the mountains of West Virginia, will not let us put her in a home. And um, quite frankly, she doesn't need to be in a home. She's hardier than the three of us are. Um, you know, my parents are, are aging. Um, I served with 32 guys on board my ship. My department had 32 guys. Uh, there are five of us left. We're all in our fifties. We should not be dying like this. And yet we are. Um, but mostly, yes, mo- mostly it's, it's the store. It's trying to balance writing obligations and getting this store set up and being a father and being a husband. Um, and I, I keep reminding myself, it will not always be this way. Once you get the store up and running, it's running. Um, and in fact, I, I hope to actually open for business a week from today. So, um, you know, I, I can see the, the end of the rainbow up ahead. Uh, but yeah, you know, it, it's, it's been a, it's been a rough couple of months, uh, as far as overextending myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we sincerely hope that once the store is open, that you do get more sleep and well, I, not only that, I, I, I want more writing time. Um, yeah. The novel I'm working on now, primarily uh, falling angels. It's the fourth book in the labyrinth series so far might be my favorite thing I've ever written. I am so excited when I work on it and it's rare for me that I see an entire novel in my head. I'm a, I'm a pantser. You know, I make it up as I go along. We talked about that last time I was on the show. This novel, I see the entire thing in my head. And it just I just want to get it out on paper. And I can't because I can only work on it about a half an hour a day. And then I got to come set up the bookstore. Um, so I'll, I'll be very excited here in another week or two when I can get back to to writing again as well. Yeah, yeah. And that now you've done once again the kind of choose your path where I've got to decide are we going down the <laughs> labyrinth? Are we talking more about the bookstore? I think we're going to jump in to the labyrinth. We'll probably jump back to the bookstore later. Right. That's how we do these conversations. But I mean, this is such a unique series. I mean, first of all, it's one of the few books that I know which actually opens with a note essentially discouraging certain readers from reading or even buying the book in the first place because you want people to be familiar with your back catalogue. I mean, th- there are people like Lovecraft who they had a mythos, but th- this takes it to another level where you are referencing <laughs> like entire books and previous right. series. I mean, yeah, it's like it's like going to see Return of the Jedi without ever seeing Star Wars or Empire or perhaps more more accurately, it's like seeing Avengers Endgame without ever having seen another MCU movie. Yeah. Um and I you know, I think it's I think it's only fair that readers know that going in. Um I do try my absolute best to make it accessible to new readers, you know. I'll give backstory and fill in details in the narrative. But what I won't do is let that slow the plot down. Um, so, you know, I, I try to balance it. I I do think that if you're a brand new reader, you've never read a Brian Keene book, you can pick up the first book in the Labyrinth series, the seven, and you can read it as a novel. And I think you'll be entertained and I think you'll understand what's going on. But, if you are familiar with my backlist, then you're going to have a deeper enjoyment and a deeper understanding. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think, I think that's definitely accurate. And I mean, you, you do essentially summarize entire novels 
in less than a paragraph to keep people up to speed. It's like you'll introduce a character and it's like, right, this is what's gone on before. But, you know, you, you do it seamlessly. It doesn't detract. It doesn't feel like, well, hang on, I'm being jolted out of the story. And I have to say, too, I mean, it has one of my favorite characters in, in the Keen universe introduced, and that's your interpretation of Lucifer. <laughs> and the uh -huh. humor involved is just, yeah, it, it's so perfect. It's one of my favorite portrayals of Lucifer. He's, uh, he's going to play a big role in, uh, in book four, the one I'm working on now. Yeah. Yeah, 90% yeah, of that novel is just uh, <laughs> Lucifer and the character of Frankie from the Rising series. Uh, so, yeah, I I enjoy him as well. Um, I like to think, Mary, if, if you ever have Mary on as a guest, she will tell you that the character of Tony Genova is is indeed my Mary Sue. And, and I'll admit that, um, you know, when I'm writing about Tony, I'm pretty much writing about myself unfiltered. Um, but I, I like to think that my fictional version of Lucifer has some aspects of me. If I had had an education beyond high school and uh, if I wore better clothes, <laughs> was a little more refined. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I suppose for anyone who's listening who isn't familiar with the Labyrinth series, could you just give us the brief elevator pitch? Sure. Um, I won't even give you the elevator, but I will keep the answer brief. I grew up on Marvel Comics in the 1970s, where everything was connected. Um, they all took place in a shared universe. And, you know, uh, as a teenager, Stephen King's works were all taking place in a shared universe. So I knew from day one, that everything I wrote was going to take place in the shared universe. And that universe is, is connected by something called the labyrinth mythos, which is basically just a fictionalized version of quantum theory and quantum mechanics and string theory for the layman. Um, and uh, with this series, I'm, I'm tying all these, these loose threads from all my various novels and stories together, there's this giant, not even apocalyptic threat. It's, it's a, a reality ending threat uh, and a, a small band of characters. I don't want to call them heroes because they're not all heroes, but a small band of characters are basically the only things that can stop it. Uh, it's, it's Stephen King's dark tower series, but it's, it's also probably more aptly Marvel superhero secret wars. Yeah. I've seen a lot of comparisons to the Avengers as well. I mean, it seems yeah. like, you know, ev every other review of, <laughs> of the mm -hmm. seven mentions the Avengers. Well, and... I even, I even touch on that in the, the second novel submerged when, yeah. uh, when Tony and Teddy are on the roof and the tsunami is hit and, you know, Tony says, he says, this isn't some superhero movie where we're all going to stand back to back and the music's going to swell and we're going to triumph. <laughs> yeah. So. And I, I wonder, too, because, I mean, you originally published this online via Patreon over a number of years. Obviously, this is what you're doing with Falling Angels as well. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that influenced and affected both the creative process to be doing it essentially live with the reader and then how that has affected things monetarily and the way that you perhaps approach writing novels and writing books from a, a kind of financial and a marketing perspective. Well, I mean, it's... You know what? Let's actually talk numbers. Um, my patron is you pay $5 a month. And for that $5 a month, you get content every single day. Uh, it may be a serialized chapter of the novel I'm working on. Like you said, right now it's Falling Angels, which is first draft material. It may be a brand new short story. It may be something behind the scenes. Uh, like a lot of people don't know. Uh, 
I was I was tapped to to reboot Reanimator, and uh, my pitch for the Reanimator reboot is available there on my Patreon. It never went anywhere, but you know, five dollars a month you get access to all this stuff. It's it's thousands of pieces of content at this point. Um, what that does for me, you know, it, it monetizes the first draft. Um, I make about depending on the month, you know, depending on where people are financially, I make between $1,200 and $1,700 off patron. Um, so that's the vast majority of me and Mary's bill. We, we pay $1,700 a month for rent, actually $1,650. Um, so, you know, on a really good patron month, the rent's taken care of. And that's off of a first draft novel that I haven't been paid for yet because it's not completed yet. You know what I mean? Cause I'm completing, I'm writing it in real time. Um, so it's incredibly freeing, but like we were talking in the, the first hour of the show about Substack, like anything else, you have to work at patron to make it become successful. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I've always been willing to experiment with things like that. And if, if if I can't figure it out, then I drop it and I move on to something else. Um, you know, patron is something I've cracked the code on. I, I figured out how to make it work for me. Um, I have gotten good enough at it that behind the scenes, patron will come to me and ask for my opinion on new things they're going to roll out and things like that. Uh, they've had me test out some things before they went, you know, line wide. Um, so yeah, I enjoy I and the other thing is as far as my readers go, I love that instant feedback. Um I don't always pay attention to it cuz you know uh I, my readers I I value their opinions, but I may not always agree with their opinion on which way the story should go or what this character is going to do, but I when I've particularly with the serials, if if I've written something that I'm super excited about and super proud of. And immediately there's, you know, seven or 12 comments of people that really fucking enjoyed that, man. I mean, that just, that makes my day right there, you know? And I wonder once you have completed the first draft on Patreon, so you've put the full book out, what happens next? How does that first draft differ from the eventual printed book? And do you deliberately say that you're not going to alter a lot of it? Do you? Oh have no, 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 no. Yeah, no. If you look at uh the the long delayed next book in the Levi Stoltzfus series, Invisible Monsters, the entire novel is available on Patreon. The first draft. Um, and I can tell people right now, the entire second half of that novel, when it is eventually published in book form, that entire second half of that novel will be something completely different because I scrapped the entire thing. The only place it's available is that patron first draft. Um, the way I do it is, you know, I, I type my first draft in word and I'm usually about three chapters ahead of whatever I post on patron. Um, but I'll copy and paste it from Word onto Patron. Um, when the novel's done, then I start the second draft, which is not done on Patron. It's not done in the public eye. It's where I go through and read this thing critically and rewrite and scrap things and add things. Um, then I do a third draft, which is mostly polish, grammar, punctuation, spelling. Um, I send it off to my beta readers. I've got a, a team of beta readers that I've used forever and we work well together. Um, and then they send me back their edits and suggestions. I incorporate those, send it off to the publisher. Um, so there are two drafts in between what's on Patreon and what's eventually published and the public never sees those. And I'm wondering in terms of if you were to approach your publisher about putting it out, do you think having a first draft available on Patreon might affect your prospects in terms of getting 
a deal like in a in a kind of negative way? Do you think that could well, be mm. I mean, bluntly speaking, now in the, the first hour of the show, we we talked a bit about privilege. Um to be blunt, yes. If it were most other authors, it would impact their prospects. Uh, because publishers don't want that. <laughs> I know this sounds egotistical. I don't mean it to sound egotistical, but I get away with it because I'm Brian Keene. <laughs> you know, uh, the 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 publishers I work with, they know the book is going to sell in printed form, so they're they're okay with that patron serial. Um, and and quite honestly, the the published form is is usually different enough from the first draft that. You know, it, it's not it's not a big deal to them, and, and sometimes it's drastically different. Like I said, when Invisible Monsters finally comes out, the the whole second half of the novel is vastly different um, than what folks read on Patreon. And it's basically your spoiler alert: it's it's Levi versus Elon Musk is is what it comes down to. So, <laughs> I mean, and, and obviously, if you if you're putting out you know serializing a story on Patreon and it's a first draft and then you decide that hey I'm going to self publish this then you should have no qualms about the editorial process or anything like that because you're you're in control of it right and and at that point right there it's probably good to let readers know hey this there's going to be changes you're going to see you you can see like you know an early draft and then you get to see the finished product exactly I also feel that that could potentially harm your chances of, you know, I mean, you'd have to kind of go like almost on a, like change up a lot of things or it's like, Hey, yeah, it's not much different than what's on Patreon. And I can get that for, you know, five bucks a month. But <laughs> see, I worried about that at first, but what I found is the vast majority of my audience, they, they want to read the finished book. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, because when I, when, when I say we serialize it on Patreon, it's not like you get in a new chapter every day. You probably get a new chapter three times a week. And in between that, there are short stories and there's behind the scenes stuff and there's an essay, um, you know, so some people don't want to wait every other day to read that serialized chapter. They want to wait until it's published in book form, you know, and then read it all at once. Same, same as binging, you know, Mary and I are watching uh true detective season four right now and I'm not feeling it. Um, and I, I wonder if it might work better to have all the episodes out and then sit down and binge them and consume them all at once. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because the weight in between, I, I just, I check out, uh, and, and I, I view patron as that, um, you know, it, it's, for those who, who don't mind, you know, the breaks in between, it, it, it's how they can consume it. And for those who want to binge, well, then they can wait till the book comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I, I thought about that. It's like, you know, I, I have stories and, and things like that, that that I feel like would work better or would be a good self-published, you know, experiment. Uh, and, you know, with, with a good cover and, you know, paying for it, doing it, doing it all the right way. And, um, it's like, well, you know, I could, I could put it out, you know, start a patron, put it out there. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm I've been kind of kicking around the idea. Uh, I don't know when I'll get to it. I have other stuff I need to finish and write and, you know, but who knows? I may decide, Hey, you know what? I'm going to self publish this and this is how I'm going to, you know, try to try this out. I mean, if it fails, it fails, but, you know, I, I would still go on with the, with the self-published, you know, aspect, put it out as, you know, a finished product. Right. Well, and there, and there's certain things, you know, Michael, you asked about, you know, how do my publishers react to me putting first drafts, everything. There's certain things that'll never end up on Patreon. Um, for example, Maurice Broaddus and I, we, we were uh solicited to write a new conan novel conan the barbarian um ultimately we had to turn the offer down uh 
but had we had we said yes and accepted the offer that's not something that i'm going to serialize and put up on patreon you know what i mean or uh the the anthology christopher golden and i are doing right now uh stories set in the world of stephen king's the stand obviously you know steve owns the rights to the stand i'm not gonna and and other authors are writing their submissions for it i'm not going to put any of that content up on patreon i may eventually put the submission guidelines up there so people can see a behind the scenes of here's how we solicited you know the stories um i could put some of me and chris's text messages up there as a behind the scenes because they're fucking hilarious um but yeah so not you you gotta, you gotta decide what's what's suitable for patron and, and what's better left monetized elsewhere yeah, I have to say that all your Patreon talk is very inspiring for me personally because, I mean, recently I've been thinking how can I re-energize the This Is Horror Patreon because I do feel that it, you know, we, we've got into a pattern, it's good, it works, but I, I almost want to give people a little bit more. We've got the early episodes, we've got the questions, we've got exclusive episodes but what you're doing is essentially giving people something every single day and i i guess like my my worry was i didn't want to kind of oversaturate the feed and it become too much but it sounds right. like it's probably not really like that at all and people can pick and choose what they do and don't read and tune into well exactly that's exactly it they can they can choose to engage or they can choose not to that day i got two words for you you want to you want to re-energize the this is hard patron blooper reels there you go i mean like in between when when bob fell out of his chair and his headphones i mean if you had been recording that and then you put it yeah no. you know I'd, I'd pay I'd pay extra for that every month. Okay. You're going to have to get some good accident insurance, Bob, because we might be getting you to do some stunts for the patrons. Why, why, why is it always I have to do the stunts? Why? <laughs> why? I'm the, I'm, I am, I'm technically like in this group right here. I'm the oldest motherfucker here. <laughs> <laughs> You, so, you built yeah. you built different, Bob. You're no, steady. I'm not, dude. I've lost, dude. I've lost so much weight. I've become cold natured. Oh, no. <laughs> you, you know how much weight you have to lose to go from I'm hot all the time to fuck. It's cold. It's not even cold, Bob. It's cold. Are you cold? I'm cold. Gonna have to yeah. start doing my own stunts like yeah. Tom Cruise then, but about <laughs> yeah. the visual appeal. But never mind. Yeah. Uh, well, you mentioned the anthology. You've mentioned the anthology a couple oh, yeah. of times. Stories set in Stephen King's The Stand, edited by yourself and Christopher Golden. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us how it came about. All right. Um, I'm going to warn the audience. I'm going to speak slower here because there's a lot that I'm not allowed to say about this. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I love you both, and you guys have always had a way of getting me to talk about things I shouldn't talk about. So I, I'm going to go slow. But, uh, you know, it, it started with uh, Chris saying, Chris and I were talking one day, eh? and because we, we try to talk just about every other day. And we were talking one day just about how good goddamn good the stand still is and how it resonates even more now you know and not all novels do that particularly a horror novel um and chris said boy wouldn't it be cool if steve would let us do an anthology of stories set in the world of the stand i said that would be very cool and chris said of course steve has never let authors play with his toys like that and i said well maybe no one's ever asked maybe you know prettiest girl in school nobody asked her to the prom so we emailed him and we said hey hey you know hey steve we were we were talking about this and you know it'd be really cool and uh he responded almost immediately all caps do it with four exclamation points and that's what i remember is the four exclamation points so 
after I after I woke up, after I'd passed out, and after Chris woke up from passing out, we got back on the phone. And we're like, "All right, is is he fucking with us, or does he really mean do it?" So you know, we verified that that he was not in fact fucking with us, and uh, we were off to the races. Um, for something like this, of course, everybody wants in because the stand is is such a seminal novel. Um, I would argue it's probably the seminal modern horror novel. Um, you know, and, and you can't you can't let everybody. You'd love to let everybody in, but you can't. So what Chris and I did was uh we started with a list of about 100 names. I put in 50 and he put in 50 and you know, we just we went through and went through it and went through it until we thought we had a really really solid lineup. And we started asking people if if they wanted to be involved. Not everyone did. Um, some of them were like, you know, no, I I I'm intimidated by that. Some of them, you know, unfortunately, they just didn't have the time time constraints. Uh, one from a a hugely popular author who I won't name because I don't have his permission. He said, no, I don't want to do the stand, but if you guys can convince him to let you do Salem's Lot as a follow up, I'm in. Um, so Steve, if you're watching, you, yeah, we are going to come at you for Salem's lot as well, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, it, it, here's the thing. Um, he didn't have to say yes to this, he, but he's, he's incredibly gracious about it. Um, and for the first time in my life, it's, it's a, Without getting into specifics, it's a deal that is, in fact, life-changing for me. As we mentioned in the first hour of the show, I was able to take part of my advance and do this. You know, build a little something for Mary and I. Um, so, you know, that's one thing he never gets the credit for. He does a lot behind the scenes for people. People writers don't know about the Haven Foundation. And if you don't, you should, uh, you know, Steve and Tabitha, they have a, a private charity, the Haven Foundation. It exists to help writers uh, who are experiencing hardships. Um, you know, he, he does a lot of stuff like that, that it never occurs to people. Every time he goes on Twitter and, and tweets about a book, um, he doesn't have to do that, you know, but it, it, it helps everyone, you know, uh, Brian Smith's Dirty Rotten Hippies collection. You know, Steve one day tweeted about the cover and how awesome the cover was. You know, Brian got bigger sales that following week than he's ever gotten for anything. Um, you know, so so for him to not only trust Chris and I with his creations, but to trust us with the stand, you know, it 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 means a lot. It means the world. And and we intend to to honor that and respect that, um, you know, we're telling people to bring their A game. And as the submissions come in, we we have not been afraid to send it back and say, "Come on, you can you can do better than this. This is the stand." Um, I I think people are going to be really blown away um, with the finished product. And in terms of guidelines that you had for authors is that anything that you can talk about and um, i mean mm. yeah i yeah i don't i don't see why we couldn't um without spoilers of course uh basically uh it can take place from the early days and and the the terms i'm going to reference here if you've never read the stand you're going to be lost but you should probably go read the stand before this book comes out. Um, it they could they could they could deal with the early days of Captain Trips, you know, when it's first making its way across the country. Uh, they could deal with when everybody's split into camps, you know, in Nebraska and then Colorado or Las Vegas, or they could go far into the future, um, you know, years after the end of the novel. Uh, you know, we didn't want them using stew or trash can man or tom cullen you know their stories have been told we wanted stories of other people um of course if their story is set in boulder 
and you know they're at the free zone committee meeting they can mention oh you know stewart stood up and gave a speech but we we didn't want stories from most characters perspectives we wanted new stories new characters the only exception for that uh was a story that Maurice brought us and actor comedian Wayne Brady are working on. I'm not going to tell you which character. Uh, Steve approved it, um, and, and that's a character. That's a main character, and the story's from their perspective. But other than that, all new characters, and just really have fun with it. We have a story from the point of view of the astronauts on the space station. A, they can't get down. B, they're starting to have dreams. Um, you know, we have a, a story set overseas. I'm not going to say which country because I don't want to spoil anything. But, you know, how would a, a character who lives in India or Pakistan or Europe who starts dreaming of Mother Abigail in Nebraska, how, how do they get there in this world? You know, um, we have stories that are set far beyond the end of the novel, uh, envisioning what that world looks like, you know. Um, it's, it's really neat to see how this opportunity energized people's creativity. Um, you know, many of the stories we've gotten are, are some of the best short stories these, these folks have in their catalog, uh, I think. Um, so it, it, I'm really excited for people to read it. I, I think it's going to be a, it's, it's nobody's a bigger constant reader than me and Chris. Um, well, that's not true, but you know, Chris and I are, are King fans. Okay. Um, we absolutely recognize the weight we're carrying with this and we're not going to drop the ball. You're going to be pleased. Do you have a projected release date for this? Can't talk about that. Um, I would, I would say it would be uh, maybe perhaps early 2025, but that is only Brian bullshitting because Michael tricked him into being loose. <laughs> um, that is not anything that's carved in stone. Don't go on social media and say, oh, Brian Keene said it was going to be January 2025 because I didn't say that. Uh, I'm saying my guess would be that. Yeah, but th this is how it happens. This is how you see, like, Hollywood Reporter or someone <laughs> pick something up. It's like, it's like Brian Keene said, one hundred percent, definitely, <laughs> early twenty twenty five. Or, or they go even further. They just pick a date. They're like, right, he said January seventh, twenty twenty five. But I, I mean, what one thing that sometimes anthologists and editors run into is they'll get two submissions that are similar enough perhaps tonally perhaps in terms of a a character that they then kind of can't run both of them so I'm wondering I mean have, have you put anything in place in case oh, yeah. you come up against that oh yeah we we had everybody had to give us basically the elevator pitch for their story um, and we did have a couple situations where tonally they were very similar. So, you know, we gave some direction and, and, and massaged that out. Uh, but yeah, we, we set it up from the beginning that we wanted to, before people started writing, we wanted to know a general idea so that we, A, we didn't have stories repeating themselves, but B, so we could spread it out. Last thing we wanted to do was, you know, 38 short stories all set at the start of the novel. Well, you know, that that's no good. Um, so. And then in terms of like weaving the puzzle together and the table of contents and ordering the stories, are you looking to do them chronologically? Is that? Mm. That's me. Um, Chris is, is his, he is super good at doing the first edit when people submit them. Uh, I think my talent is in putting the puzzle together, reading the stories and saying, Ooh, this is a good opener. Chronologically, this should follow. Um, that's how we did it with uh, the drive-in multiplex, the, the anthology we did uh, similar to this, but for Joe R. Lansdale's, the drive-in mythos, um, you know, 
Uh, and I'm basically just using the same method for this. Hmm. I can give Is you he... one spoiler. I can give you one yes. spoiler. David J. Scow's story will close the anthology. So. Oh. Oh, wow. <sighs> Yes. <laughs> Just yes. <laughs> All that needs to be said. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess, I guess in, in going chronological, I mean, I, I, I assume that y'all are using the, uh, the, the later version of the stand. Yeah. We decided to, compared to the, the lean uh, and mean original one. Yeah. We decided that the, the uncut, uh, version, the version that's set in the nineties, mm-hmm. that was going to be Canon. Um, and, and for that, we uh, we consulted with Bev Vincent, you know, the the resident king expert. Yeah. Uh, and and, you know, and Bev said, yeah, most most readers consider that one to be the canon. So that was the one we went with. Yeah. So the stories will be set during that time. Yeah, I, I, I remember reading it. And I, obviously, I read the, the original one first, which uh, I guess it's now called the lean, and, the lean and Mean. And it ain't lean at all uh <laughs> you know it's it's still a door stopper but uh i remember when it when it came out people were like you know it's like why did he do this and i'm like going i've read it and i was like it's fantastic i mean it's like it it's just he took something and made it even better it's like because it's longer i'm like no it's just better it's not long length has nothing to do with it it's richer it's fuller so yeah that's i'm glad y'all made that canon um because that would have been confusing in the timeline. Wait, was it the eighties or nineties? What's the deal? <laughs> See, I'm wondering: will there be anything between the stories? You mean like little editorial notes or something like that? Well, I mean, sometimes in these situations, that there uh, there's like another kind of story connecting it together. No. No, the story connecting it together is is the novel, the stand. Yeah, um, and we've been lucky enough; we've got a good stable of authors that you know every story is its own and stands on its own. But when you put the puzzle together, they tell a a broader story as well. Yeah. So yeah, so there won't be anything like that. Yeah. So um, that was that was the one thing you know. Chris and I are both believers in you know. If you're editing the anthology, you shouldn't put your own story in the anthology. Um, that's what we were raised. That's raised on. That's what we were taught. And, and that's what we try to do. Um, it killed us not to write a story for the drive-in anthology. Um, and it's killing us even more not to write a story for the stand anthology. But, you know, it is what it is. Happy to give other people the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's certainly the school that I'd subscribe to as well. It's like if I'm the anthologist or the editor, then I'm also not the writer, you know, right. <laughs> one or the other. But yeah, I I can't wait to read this. And I mean, hopefully when it comes out, which may or may not be 2025, <laughs> then we can do a round table with a number of the authors and really get into this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But we've got a question from Tracy Kenworth via Patreon. Okay. And she wants Hi, to Tracy. know she wants to know with the opening of the bookstore, does this mean that you and Mary may retire from writing? Will you be looking to scale things back? Also, what does this mean for your other ventures such as the Patreon and the newsletter and other things that you've got going on? That's a good question, Tracy. Um, there will always be a newsletter. There will always be a patron. Um, you know, I I need that newsletter that I look forward to Saturday mornings. That's when I do my newsletter. And I, I look forward to writing that, that essay every week for readers. Um, I need that in my life. So, no, I would never stop doing that. Um, you know, does it mean we're going to retire from writing? Absolutely not. Writers don't retire. They just die. <laughs> um, but we are both aware that we're slowing down. I used to be able to 
sit down and write five, 6,000 words a day. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. Um, these days, I'm lucky if I can do 2,000. Um, part of it is arthritis. Part of it is I have to stand up and move every hour. Um, you know, I got a little arm that makes me do that. Part of it is just, you know, eyesight. Um, as you get older, you slow down. Um, so I, neither of us intend to ever stop writing, but we would both like to get to a place where we don't have to write all day, every day. You know, um, I would still write every day cause I, I, I enjoy writing every day, but you know, maybe it's an hour a day, maybe it's two hours a day. Um, we would like very much to get to that point. Um, so the, the bookstore is a, a way of reaching that point, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of the bookstore itself, I mean, you have obviously put a lot of things in place to as much as one can guarantee that it is a success. So I want to know a little bit about those kind of steps that you've taken and what perhaps you'll be offering that a number of bookstores aren't offering. Yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I did was talk to Dell and Sue Hallison who run dark delicacies out in Burbank, California. Um, you know, we mentioned in the first hour of the show that Jesus and I used to talk about doing this. Um, what we would say is, we should see if Del and Sue will let us franchise Dark Delicacies, and we'll do it on the East Coast. Um, so the store is designed very much with with them as sort of our spiritual guides. Um, you know, we're now Dark Delicacies features horror. We have a huge horror section, but we're we're also speculative fiction. So there's a sci-fi and fantasy section. There's a media tie-in section. There's a bizarro section over there. Um, there's an entire second half of the store back here. That's comic books and magazines and pulps and graphic novels. Um, but you're not going to find chicken soup for the soul. You're not going to find whatever Oprah's pitching. It's a speculative fiction store. Um, as far as what we're offering, a knowledgeable staff, first of all, um, and that's not just me and Mary, whoever, whoever we hire on, they're going to have to have a, a love for this, not necessarily a knowledge, because if they're young, they might not have the knowledge yet, but they have to have a love for it. Um, you know, we've been doing this long enough that we know every single person in this industry, and most of them like us. Um, so you know, we're going to, we're going to have, it's going to be in a, a, a destination driven store. I don't know that the average person who lives here in town and walks by, I don't know that they're going to come in every day and spend money. Uh, some will. Um, but you know, dark delicacies, butcher cabin books down in Kentucky. These are places that you make a point to go and visit. Um, and, and this will this will be the same way. I've already had people saying, you know, I'm coming out from Michigan this summer. Can you recommend a hotel? Where's the nearest airport? Um, you know, we're, we'll have events every week, of course. And, and that's where knowing everybody comes into play. You go through the Rolodex and, hey, I see you have a new novel coming out in August. Let's schedule a signing. Um, we're going to do workshops and classes. Uh Mike Hawthorne, the comic artist who's known for Deadpool and Spider-Man and Batman, you know, he's going to come in and do a, uh, you know, some, some live drawing, live illustrating so people can see how that's done. Um, you know, all kinds of things like that. Uh, basically just trying to build a community out of the store. We're very close to Philly, to Baltimore, to D.C., not that far from New York City. So, you know, we're we're hoping that we'll have some events that'll that'll draw people in once a month. You know, they'll make it down here for that. Um make sure that everyone who walks in the door feels welcome and special and valued. Um, which is the same thing you do with your readers, you know. It's it's 
it's a different it's a, a a different transaction but it's still your customers you know it, it you you want to make sure every reader who reads your book whether they liked it or not that you you want them to know that you're grateful for them, that they spent the money, that they took the time. You want them to know that you you value their input, and it's it's going to be the same with everybody that walks in through that door. Um, you know, so that's what we're striving for. I went off in the weeds. I'm not sure I actually answered the question. No, did I, I? Did, I I think you did, and I okay. mean, you mentioned having a load of upcoming events and already on the website, in spite of the store not being open yet, you have got a lot of events. Booked. Well, that's, I don't even have them all up. I had to stop. Cause I'm just like, this is overkill, Brian. You know, there's uh, there's some stuff I haven't even announced yet, but yeah, early on we have uh, the very first signing is going to be uh, Stephen Kozanowski, Summer Cannon, Wiley Young and Wesley Southard. Uh, they're followed a week later by Todd Kiesling and Cynthia Paleo, uh, and followed, I think two weeks after that by John Urban sick, Jessica Epley and Matt Wilson. And yeah, it, I've booked out through December of this year. Like I said, I haven't announced them all yet, but it's, it's, it's going to be a happening hopping place, man. Yeah. Yeah. And for these events, for people interested can they just show up? Do they need to get a ticket in advance? How yeah, will up. that work? Show up, show up. Um, you know, if if it's somebody who we like, let's say hypothetically we have Paul Tremblay or Joe Hill or Tanner of Dew signing here. I'm going to expect a line. I'm going to expect a crowd, and, and we're gonna we're gonna treat that accordingly. Um, if it's John Urbansick, John's one of my best friends in the world, so he knows I say this with love, but John ain't going to have six blocks of people lined up out there. So, you know, we we can, we can we know what to expect, depending on who's signing and what the event is. Um, but, no, I don't see that we'll be selling tickets or anything. Um, if it's, let's say Dean Kuntz comes back to Pennsylvania to visit family and he wants to do a signing, we're probably not going to have him do a reading because – the room where all that takes place only holds 30 people maximum. Um, so we'd probably just do a signing and they, you know, they'll come in the door and buy their book and go through and get them to sign it and go out the other door. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it'll all be very manageable. Yeah. We, we need to have a way to make sure that we certainly drop in your bookstore to Dean well, Koontz when we talk and, to him and, next, <laughs> next week, and see if we can get him booked. And what what I want to mention to folks, you know, I, I I know that people have limitations. They, you know, there's probably someone out there right now who said, "Oh, Brian Keane thinks I can just afford to fly there from Australia." Well, no, I'm not saying that at all. Um, anybody who does a signing here at the store, their books are available for pre order at vortexbooksandcomics.com. Um, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can still get your book signed. You pre-order it, let us know how you want it signed. And the, the day they're here in the store, I'll have them sign your copy and it'll go in the mail the next day. There you go. You don't have to fly to the book. The book will fly to you. Exactly. I mean, you know, we're not going to put the entire store's inventory online because mm. that would be ridiculous. But, you know, I, I've got 2000 comic books over here in this room. I'm not going to put every one of those online, but Anybody that's here doing a signing, their books, signed copies are available to pre-order and, you know, then they'll, they'll be available afterward while supplies last. Yeah. And obviously you've got a lot of rare collectibles. You've got a lot of things that are difficult to get a hold of. So, I mean, you, you said you won't have obviously the entire inventory online particularly i imagine because you know it changes from day to day but Absolutely. if somebody yeah if somebody were looking for a specific issue let's say of a comic i mean could they email you and ask you do you have that in is that i'm probably i'd love to be as a fan and a collector i'd love to be able to offer that as a realistic business person mm -hmm. i'm not gonna i'm not gonna open that door yeah. Um, like, I'll give you an example. 
There's a room back that way, two rooms past this room, where I have books signed by Brian Lumley, who regretfully just passed. I have books signed by Stephen King. I have I have a chat book that Monica O'Rourke signed to Weston Oaks. And then somehow Dave Thomas from the horror show ended up with it. And Jeff Cooper then signs it. Fuck Weston. This is yours now. Um, you know, that's a piece of history. Um, you know, rare stuff like that, that I only have one copy of. You're going to have to come here to the store to get it. I've, I, you know, I've got, a a first edition clickers paperback that Jesus Gonzalez signed to Dave. That's not even going to be for sale. That's, that's going to be in the, the display case between their two ashes. Um, you know, but there's, there's so much rare stuff that we have in addition to new books. And I, I don't want to risk sending something like that through the mail. I mean, Brian Lumley's not here to sign books anymore. You you buy that sign Brian Lumley off of me. I mail it to you. The post office eats it between here and Japan. We're all screwed, you know? So a, a lot of it, yeah, you're going to have to make the trip. But, you know, if, you, if you're a Cynthia Paleo fan or a Summer Cannon fan or a Todd Kiesling fan, you can get your book signed. We will take care of you, you know? All right. And in terms of the live readings and events, are there any plans to put videos online? Would you potentially stream it live? Would it be available after the event? I'm I'm just thinking for people who can't Possibly. get mm, mm. Possibly. Um what we're doing tonight, this appearance on This Is Horror is actually a test run for me. I wanted to see A how good the Wi-Fi is, B, if the sounds of street traffic out there were interfering. Now, you guys haven't complained, so I'm guessing you have, haven't been able to hear the street traffic. There's not um, been a lot at all, no. Yeah, we may. I don't think we'll do it for the first signing. Uh, Kazanowski, Young, Southern, and Cannon, I don't think we'll do it in time for them. But I think eventually we will probably live stream You know the Q&As, the readings. Um, we won't live stream everything because, you know, you, 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 you want to give people a reason to come to the store. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think for some of the, the bigger things or the things that are going to be really fun, like we have Jeff Strand in September. Now, if you've never had an opportunity to hear Jeff Strand read live, it is an event. I can't see not live streaming that, you know what I mean? So, yeah, we'll we'll play it by ear, but I'm I'm thinking along those lines. I, I for a brief moment I thought about well we could just do a new podcast, you know, call it From the Vortex, and I would interview people before they sign. And then Mary said, "Are you insane? You you have enough to do. You don't need to start another podcast." So she talked me out of it. I'm glad she did. Yeah, but, yeah, I feel so many ideas i can translate into that could be a podcast and it's like no right you already have one bloody podcast just yep one's enough slow it down but yeah um in terms of the internet connection by the way when we do these i make sure that it's pretty high resolution that we're recording and so for some people you know, I, I have to turn that down a bit, but your connection is, yeah, it has managed to do good. it no what, problem. So it's looking good. Me, what they're charging me a month, it better be good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it seems good for the live stream and for recording. So, yeah, the, the test run is a success. Good. But, I mean, you, of course, put your own money into this you then had an additional go fund me so i'm wondering how that came about and what kind of things have you been able to do to take it to the next level as a result of the go fund me i was pretty adamant that i did not want to do a go fund me um cuz i i always feel weird about doing those now don't get me wrong when i when i had my accident when i got burned for listeners who don't know i i had second and third degree burns on my head 
my arm, my elbow was down to the bone. Um, and I don't have health insurance. So I was, I was very grateful for the GoFundMe that Stephen Kosinowski and Joe Ripple started. Um, but in general, I don't like doing that. I don't mind contributing to them. I don't mind signal boosting them. I just, I don't like doing one for myself, but a lot of people whose opinions I trust, who've been in this business longer than I have said, you ought to do a GoFundMe. You ought to give the community a chance to feel like they contributed, that they were a part of this too. And I said, all right, so what's a reasonable amount? Let's, let's do 20 K thinking we wouldn't get 20 K maybe we'd get five or 10 and that would be fine. In hindsight, I'm very glad that people wiser than me talked me into doing that because what happened is Mary and I sunk a substantial sum into this and had no money left over to buy inventory. <laughs> and, you know, books are expensive. Comic books are expensive. So, uh, you know, with people doing that, we, we, we were able to stock the store. If, if people hadn't contributed it would have been the saddest looking bookstore on opening day. There'd have been like four copies faced out on each shelf. And, you know, um, so incredibly grateful and incredibly grateful to, to our peers who sent signed books and to fans who sent books from their collections. Like, hey, I don't want these anymore. I've got an almost complete run of William W. Johnstone's novels over there. Now, when I was 14, I loved William W. Johnstone's horror novels. At 56, I don't love them. <laughs> They're objectively terrible. But they are big with the nostalgia factor right now, and they're hugely popular because of Grady's paperbacks from hell. Um, and they're impossible to find, let alone in, in the condition they're in. And, and we had our readers just like, here, I don't want these anymore. I love your books. Love what you're doing. These are for the store. Um, you know, that could potentially be a month's rent if we sold them all on opening day. Um, you know, so, so many people, I don't want to start listing names because I know I'll forget, but, you know, like, like Owen King sent us a bunch of signed rarities and Chris Triana, Aaron Beauregard, Daniel Volpe, Tim Wagner, so many, Dwayne Swarzynski, I just, Opened a box from him yesterday. One signed copy of pretty much his entire backlist. Um, you know, for people to do that, it it does feel like it's it's the community's store. You know what I mean? Um, so I I'm glad that I was convinced to to do the GoFundMe, even though I was really adamant about not doing it at first. Um, so. You know, and I'm sure there'll be hiccups and headaches and things I haven't anticipated. And, you know, it's like that in everything you do. But, you know, we're going to hit the ground running. Like I said, we hope to be open next week. And, you know, as we make mistakes, we'll learn from them and course correct. For people listening who want to support the store, be it financially, be it in any capacity, what kind of things can they do? I mean, uh, you know, look, if you're looking to sell your collection, be it books, be it pulp magazines, be it comics, we, you know, we're not only selling, we're also buying because we're going to have high turnover. Um, you know, but if, if you if you have stuff like that that you want to donate, send it to the address on the website, vortexbooksandcomics.com. Um it's not tax deductible. I'd like to tell you it is, but it's not, but we appreciate it. Um, you know, if, if you want to support it financially and, and you're within driving distance, well, come shop here. And if you're not in driving distance, go to the website and, and click signed copies or I, what, what does it say? On, hang on. Let me pull up the website. I should know this. Vortex books and comics got, okay. I'm at, if you go to online store, you click the tab that says online store. As I said, you can you can pre-order signed copies on there. If you do that, that's helping us out, you know, or just spread the word once we're open. And and I would look, I 
I've never been one to mince words. And over the last 30 years, rightfully or wrongfully, that I've earned my fair share of detractors. Um, if you dislike me, if you're a reader and you dislike me, know that you're still welcome to come shop here. I, I mean it when I say this door is open to everybody. Um, you know, maybe don't tell me I'm an asshole while I'm behind the counter, but you, you come, come and shop, you know, and we're happy to have you. And if you're a writer who dislikes me, know that you can still come here and do a signing. We are happy to accommodate you. We're happy to host you, you know, reach out. Um, I mean it when I say this is for everybody. So that's all. I had other questions, but I'm almost tempted to end the episode there because it's just such a perfect ending, but I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> one well, of the most the, positive the things I've, I've ever, ever right? <laughs> <laughs> one of the most positive things I've ever heard you say. It just <laughs> I know well, there you go. for, for it's everybody and genuine. For everyone who has given me shit about the ending to the rising since 2003, there's a happier ending for you right there. Mm -hmm.